Welcome to Halting Toward Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger, and we've been talking about the Israelites' time in the wilderness, uh, when they came right up to the promised land and said, oh, nope, that looks scary. And God said, okay, into the wilderness with you for 40 years. And we talked last week about how God used that time to prepare the Israelites for the promised land. Now, the trials are always for our good, but the attitude of us during the trials <laughs> sometimes needs some work. <laughs> and so it was with the Israelites. Um, we're, we're told how they grumbled in the wilderness and they were, rather than being thankful to God, they questioned him and turned away from him repeatedly, and he showed his might to bring them back. But this thanklessness idea, we see again in Romans 1. And it takes kind of a surprising turn in Romans 1. Greg, do you want to show us where we go? Yeah, sure. This is a passage that anyone who's studied total depravity or Christian apologetics or epistemology ends up in again and again. I know I've taught through it lots and lots. Uh, we, we we all know the previous verse, the just shall live by faith. But then Paul goes into this, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God hath showed it unto them for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even as eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. But because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful. There's the word. They were not thankful. But became in vain in their imagination. Their foolish heart was dark, and in professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like unto corruptible man, to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to the uncleanness of the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator. Now, there's more. We may come back to it or not. I don't know. But it, it, it's interesting in this, this time of um, profound theological teaching that, that Paul lays out before us, we come to, and they weren't thankful. You know, when sometimes we think, well, but that, you know, that sure we ought to be thankful. We ought to thank God before every meal. We grumble a lot, but that's kind of a side issue. I mean, we're, we, we want to talk about basic epistemology and apologetics and, and how we know God and uh, what the unbeliever knows of God and all that stuff. And in, in yet Paul, right in the middle of this, plops down on this issue of thanklessness. Yeah. Now, it's not a theological <laughs> wrong doctrine. It's an attitude of the heart. And and thus, it, it, it to many, it seems out of place. But Paul doesn't think so. Well, first of all, what, what he says and what I just read, God's wrath is revealed even from heaven, from the heavens, from the skies, against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth. And the word for hold is hold down or suppress. They have it, but they try to keep it out of sight, even to themselves. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. God reveals himself in the world around them and in man himself. Heavens declare the glory of God. All the people see his righteousness many like texts, but also man being the very image of God inevitably reveals God to those around him and, and to himself. So the the argument will show me proof for God. Look into your heart. The argument is never, it should never be over whether or not God exists. As far as God's concerned, that's a given. Everybody knows God exists. Problem is what you do with that. Do you embrace that? Are you thankful for that fact, or are you dissatisfied with God? 
Yeah, well, God's never done anything for me. <laughs> yeah, not, not <laughs> Says much. man breathing air. <laughs> yeah. Well, his heart beats and his brave waves function. For the invisible things of him, some render that his invisible attributes, things that are true of God, from creation or since the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by by the things or by means of the things that he has made even as eternal power and Godhead, so that they were without excuse. His eternal power, sovereign, the sovereign power of God, and that the fact that he is God and he's distinct from his creation. There is a God and we aren't him. And he has sovereign power. That, at the very least, every man is confronted with. Every man in his own heart, in his own conscience, knows this. Because if he didn't, then he wouldn't be a sinner. You can't sin against a God who, as far as you're concerned, doesn't exist. I'm, maybe you can you can work around well ignorance of the fact of God is no excuse. But that's the Bible never never describes sin as simply breaking worlds we didn't know were there. Mm -hmm. Sin is consistently described as a hatred of God, a rejection of God, rebellion against God, willful breaking of his commandments. And, and if man really didn't know that God existed, if it was, there's a God I never knew, that would change the game. But mm -hmm. Paul says that's not the way it is. There is within man and in the world around us just as it stands, sufficient evidence. We don't have to, we don't have to look into microscopes. We don't have to look through telescopes. We can just breathe, as you say, feel our heartbeats, see the world around us, and we're face to face with God. The unbeliever may ask, "Well, how is that? I don't see that." No, you do actually see that, and your every choice reflects that fact. Um, you don't. Why, why is it that you're getting angry about this God person anyway? If he really doesn't exist, if someone would come up and and say, Ra is angry with you. It's kind of the lines of Santa Claus is angry with you. You can't laugh at all. Like, no, there's no such person. Start saying the God of the Bible is angry with you. We start getting indignant. We get angry. We don't want to hear that. That matters. Why does that matter? Mm -hmm. Because we know it's true. And so when we try, we start out as apologists trying to prove the existence of God. What we in fact have already admitted is, well, maybe you don't know. Maybe it's not clear. Maybe the proof isn't there. Maybe we have to add something on top of that. Maybe we have to have clever arguments in a chain of reasoning or some kind of, of uh, historical or scientific evidence, and then you'll become um, personally accountable before God, which is what it comes down to. And I don't know that all apologists have actually thought through to that. Mm -hmm. they, they, they understand that people say they don't believe in God, and they try to present the evidence do they understand that when you do that, what you're saying is these people really aren't accountable, at least not in any full sense, because they really don't know God's there. And the Bible itself never assumes that. The fool may say in his heart there is no God, but that doesn't mean he actually believes it or acts like it. Mm -hmm. Every time a man says, I remember, really, what is this memory thing you speak of and how can you trust it? Well, you're wrong about that. What is this wrongness thing? But I love her. It's important to me. Why? What do you care? What is this love thing? Well, throughout the day, we're constantly calling upon things that assume the existence of a sovereign creator God. And then we turn around and say, but he doesn't really exist. Yes, all these things that I say I believe and that I do and that are important to me, yes, theoretically, they all assume a sovereign God, because I never really thought through that. <clears throat> but no, I don't believe in God at all. Never thought about it once. Absolutely foolish. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and so, like, it behooves us, right, to both answer the fool according to his folly mm -hmm. and answer the fool not according to his folly. <laughs> answer not a fool according to his yeah. folly. But we went... Augustine is fantastic at this, of course, being Augustine, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but in City of God, he puts aside all of the philosophers, essentially, except for Plato, because yeah. he's like, Plato's the best you've got, I'll deal with him, the rest <laughs> of you step aside. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he uses Plato um, with great respect, not, um, not belittling Plato, yeah. as it were, but saying, look, this is what you know, look further, like, this already tells you all you need to know. 
mm-hmm. but let me tell you about Jesus, you know. Um, but at the same time, he's forcing Plato to see the inconsistencies in his own right. worldview. Well, Paul says that such are without excuse, but as you say, well, then is there any point in conversation? You quoted the two verses from Proverbs or alluded to them. Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceits. Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest thou be like unto him. So we're not to descend into the fool's folly by pretending that it's legitimate. Mm-hmm. That he's got, yeah, wow, you've got a point there. I don't know. It's, this is hard. But maybe we can reason our way. No, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> but on, on the other hand, we don't want to leave him thinking that we got nothing to say. What we have mm-hmm. to say ultimately is the gospel. Mm-hmm. What we have is sort of the jujitsu move of let us show you what you actually say, act on, believe, and do on a regular basis, and show you that you already believe in God. Mm-hmm. Now, having done that and having admitted your own sins, let's show you the Savior. So we we do engage in conversation. But it's not one where we are foolish enough to admit, well, you have a point. I, I, I can see how you would think that, that God doesn't really exist. But let me let me supply an argument mm-hmm. that will one-up God's revelation of himself in creation and in Scripture. It's rather arrogant on our part to think that we can outdo God. We need to simply get out of the way, as it were, and let God's general and special revelation do the work. But even, even that process of getting out of the way will require a great deal of us, a great deal of prayer and thought and knowing what to say and what not to say and and how to present the obvious. The self-evident would be a better word. You know, you know the, <laughs> the declaration speaks of these true self-evident. It doesn't mean obvious. It means that if you deny them, your system crashes and burns. The evidence itself is within it. The, the statements. You can't deny this and go on having any kind of system. Christian, Christianity is self-evident. That is, if you deny it, you don't have anything left. Mm-hmm. If you have no absolutes, then simple things like truth, knowledge, memory, love, morality, they're gone. Uh, and you're left with, well, I believe this because I want to believe this and I have absolutely no reason for believing it. But it's what I'm going to believe, and you can't convince me of other otherwise. You realize that you just signed off your love for your family, your sweetheart, patriotism, uh, any convictions about what the past or future may hold, meaning, truth, any kind of absolute, you just reject it. Yeah, well, which includes anything you say from this point, you have admitted is not in any sense absolutely true. Why are we having this conversation at this point? <laughs> You've got nothing left. And if, if you want to be a babbling voice that has nothing to say, I mean, God leaves you that. You can be a fool until Judgment Day. But that that's where this goes. And and so we come in the passage, it says, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful. What What's the spiritual spring of all this? And it, it's not an intellectual mistake. It's not they took a, a, a wrong turn on a priori versus <laughs> post priori or some some such thing. It's real simple. God presented himself in his world and said, here I am. And they said, no, nah, not good enough for us. Your, your creation isn't good enough. Your loss stinks. You know, the attributes you describe are unreasonable. What you ask for us is ridiculous. Grumble, 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 grumble. And... Because of that, they decided. Um, in, in, in fact, what are the who was it? Someone I was. Oh, it was uh, of course American Gospel. Mm. Um, one of, one of the speakers who, in some respects, I, I I don't remember the guy, the young man's name, but in some respects, I appreciated him because he was by far the most consistent, and thus was no longer a Christian. Mm. He'd given up the faith because he said, as I was thinking through. What God I could get along with, I, I kept reinventing God. <laughs> and I came up with some great gods. The last one I came up was, he was excellent. I mean, he was just like me. <laughs> and then I realized that that doesn't work. And I gave up the whole God thing. I mean, there's, a, there's a tragic um, 
realism there we, we need to weep for. I'd love to talk to this guy and point out to him what he's doing. But that's where he's left. He's left with, well, I, I invented God all I could and kept trying to invent a God I could get along with and that I could appreciate. And in the end, the one I got was so like me, he really didn't help at all. So I just, I just chunk the whole thing. And that's what Paul begins to describe, that because they were thankless, that left their hearts, the, the center and core of their personality and being, dark. They, they claimed to be wise, but they in fact were fools, incapable of interpreting God's creation, his revelation aright. Uh, and they changed the glory of God into an image. They started making images, idols, when it says of, they changed the um, image of God into an image made like to corruptible man, to birds, to four-footed beasts and creeping things. There's a sort of devolution here. They start mm -hmm. with images of God and then go on to birds, which at least fly in, the he in heaven. And then we go to four-footed beasts and eventually creeping things, snakes and dung beetles and things like this. Uh, sort of what uh, Van Til called uh, devolution, that's not the word he used, into the void. Mm -hmm. um, where you keep sinking down further and further until there's nothing left because you, you, you have no absolutes. You have nothing to hold on to. You have no claims to say this is better than that. And you keep reinventing God in search of something you can trust and love and be happy with. And you're never satisfied. And it just gets worse and worse and lower and lower and lower. You can see that in the Greek deities hmm. and the the atomizing of it like you've got the the god that guards the door but then you've also got the god of the lintel and the door jam <laughs> and the the floorboards and it's like i thought we had a god to guard the door but apparently he needed some help yeah yeah you yeah, know the god who uh plants helps you plant the seed and the one who brings it to spring up and the god mm -hmm. who's responsible for the budding and the flowering and the fruit and the harvesting and yet, all are all of these gods? Are these individual gods, or are these all faces of one spiritual yet impersonal divine force? The Greeks themselves, the Romans, were not terribly clear about all this, mm -hmm. and yet they went freely to temples and bowed themselves to images which they knew were man-made. Mm -hmm. They were bowing down to things that they knew humans had made. And of course, the prophets are full of mockery of this things. Isaiah is the greatest. I stumbled across <laughs> it in Hosea the other day in Bible study. This constant theme, it's the work of a workman. What do you <laughs> think you're doing? The rest of that wood went into the fire to yeah. cook your hot dogs, and you're worshiping this other piece of wood from the same log. It doesn't make no. sense. No, it, it doesn't make sense. It's insane. It's, mm -hmm. it's irrational in the truest sense of the word. And in a sense, they know what they're doing. Now, they can justify it. They can say, no, you, you don't understand. This is this itself is not the God. God is behind it, in it, through it, under it, whatever. This is our point of, merely our point of contact. Well, that's a nice philosophy, but anybody who watches you will see you bowing down to the piece of wood. They don't see you bowing down to some spiritual power someplace else. And as you play this out in your lives, this is practically what it becomes hmm. until you get to the point where the ordinary believer identifies the two. I, I remember, you remember the old TV series Dragnet? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Jack Webb plays Sergeant Friday a cop. I'm pretty sure it was, it, I'm pretty sure it was, it was um, Dragnet, although it might have been out of 12 since Jack Webb had a hand in both. But uh, a church has its little baby Jesus stolen. <laughs> from the crib on the eve of Christmas. And it's a big deal because they always celebrate with this little baby Jesus and make a big deal of him. And they can't imagine why anyone would steal it if it's an act of vandalism or what. And it, it runs throughout the show. It's a minor theme and it's a plot thread. And at the very end, it turns up in the little wagon of some small boy who said, who says, well, I didn't mean any to hurt anything, but I promised the baby Jesus if he did X for me, I would give him a ride in my new wagon. And so I was just <laughs> keeping my promise. You know, and everybody smiles, except it's not that funny. Mm -hmm. When we get to the point where people actually think that these things with, we've made with our hands are for all practical purposes God, or God is so thoroughly identified with them, 
that we can treat this thing as if it were God. And anybody who's studied even a little bit of cultural anthropology or any good missionary stories will see that that's what happens. Uh, it, it may be that the philosophers amongst them make the fine distinctions, but ordinary people don't. And that's why the, the Bible is not mistaken. It's not ignorant when you were quoting the passage or referring to a passage in Isaiah about, you know, I took a, you, you cut down the log and you make some of it, you make an idol and some of it, you make a fire to roast and you, you cook, as you say, your hot dog. And you don't have the sense to see that this is the same log. Well, it's, it's see, but it's the, it's the spiritual principle. We, no, you're bowing down to a log. And, and, and the Bible's not ignorant here. The Bible's not written by ignorant men who didn't get it. They knew exactly what the mystics said. They just didn't believe them. Mm -hmm. What they looked at was what you actually did. And what you actually did was bow down to a log, a stone, a stump. And, does it, 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 no, and how you carve it, does that help? No, it doesn't help. No, but see, mine's carved like a bird. That makes it so much better. No, it doesn't. <laughs> you really... No, dung beetles are where it's at. Doesn't help. No, it's not. <laughs> and so there's this, this ongoing attempt in, in, in terms of this thanklessness. I don't like God. I am not thankful for him. I will now generate my own God out of my own heart. I will create God in my image. And I will fall down and worship my own creative ability. Of course, man is worshiping himself in the thing that he has made. Of course, what he finds out is the only answers he gets back from it are the ones he put into it, <laughs> and that otherwise it does not move, it does not speak. As uh, Augustine points out, yeah, uh, Rome, you had these great gods, and, and, and you think that everything went wrong because you deserted them. These were the gods that Aeneas had to rescue from fallen Troy because <laughs> they couldn't walk. Yeah. Great gods you got there. And again, you can talk all you want. About well, no, but the mystical print. The, the, the read the poets, read Homer, read Virgil. They have no question about it. These were the gods that they were moving. Whatever the connection, it is close enough that to move the idol is to move the god. And if the idol is destroyed, the god loses his presence and power. Which is one of the one of the few reasons for reading the classics, actually. So you can let the pagans <laughs> talk by themselves and stop listening to people touched by Christian society trying to reinterpret in the light of Christianity. Mm. Oh, that reminds me. I wanted to retract my statement that Augustine said Virgil was trash. It was a gross <laughs> oversimplification at best and a misrepresentation at worst. I take well, it back. Did, some, did someone speak to you about this? No, I spoke to myself in my heart. Oh. <laughs> okay. But. Yeah, I didn't. I, I When you said that, I was, I was caught off a little bit and I wasn't... Yeah, you've been reading Augustine more than I have lately, so I didn't know if I'd missed something. But, you know, by the time we get to Dante, it's all about Virgil and Aeneas and all of that. And Augustine much preferred the, the Roman classics to the Greek classics. He spends a lot of time with that in his confessions. But that's a side issue. So let's, let's, let's come back again to this idea of being thankful. Um, to show how deep it, the idea runs in Reformed theology, the Heidelberg Catechism is divided into three parts, knowing how great my sin and misery are, knowing how I'm redeemed from my sin and misery. And then third, knowing how to be thankful to God mm -hmm. for such redemption. The Christian life, it sums up as simply thankfulness. So it, it's, it's not a minor strain. It's not simply one say, fruit of the Spirit among many others, something we can diminish or largely ignore in our uh, imperfect spiritual growth. Uh, the Bible highlights it, and Reformed theology has always highlighted thankfulness as, in many ways, the, the heart of, of, of the Christian life, as, as worship. We, we come before God. You, you, we, I guess we need to think about what it means to say to God, thank you. Mm -hmm. It means God's right and we're wrong. It means that even though I didn't enjoy this, God has a purpose in it for me that supersedes my understanding, my willingness to endure it, my definition of good and bad. Uh, I have to lay all that down. To be thankful is to set aside my opinions, uh, my attitudes, my preconceptions, my willfulness, and say to God, I don't completely get it, but thank you 
because I know you're right. And I don't really know how or why right now. Because to me, it seems like I, if, if I were God, I would do this. <laughs> but let's praise the Lord. I'm not God. And God knows better. And I can be thankful that he does. You can think here of the book of Job. Job, in the end, says, you know, borrowing a line from um, Bug's Life, shutting up. <laughs> because sometimes we have to do that in order to be thankful. We have to shut up mm-hmm. and and acknowledge, simply acknowledge God's right. Mm-hmm. And, and God has done us great good. Uh, and we don't understand the extent of that good. We won't this side of glory, but we can begin to work on it. Yeah. And as we look at Israel in the wilderness, of course, they had huge problems with that. They didn't like the food. They didn't like the laws. They didn't like the leaders. They didn't like the environment. They didn't like, you know, you go down the list of all the things they complained about. There was, there was not a whole lot left that they didn't complain about, which is to say they were complaining about God attribute by attribute. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so when one, one of the uh, amazing stories that comes out of uh, the wilderness experience is, is not, not, and not because of the miracle, but because of the people's reaction to the miracle, uh, De- or, uh, Korah, Nathan and Abiram, uh, rebel against God. And there's all of that. It ends with the earth opening its mouth and devouring them. And you think, okay, that kind of settled it. And <laughs> in fact, Moses' point was, if if these men die the death of all men, then God has not sent me. But if the God does a new thing and opens it, the earth opens its mouth, then you better know and that's what happens. And yet the next day we read that the people woke up and began to grumble and said to Moses, Aaron, you've killed the people of the Lord. Uh, what? <laughs> oh, yeah. I opened up the earth's mouth and <laughs> took care of it. Yeah. That, they, they'd grown up in Egyptian culture, which was drenched in magic. And so they had simply concluded, logically enough from their point of view, that Moses was simply a better sorcerer than anyone they'd met. And he'd done some really cool stuff and a lot of it had been helpful. But this was too far because mm-hmm. these were God's people. What? <laughs> well, you know, there's a, this this promise that God made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, which means we get a free ticket to do what we want and be where we ought to be. And you've just done nothing but try to elevate yourself among us. You've made just yourself altogether a prince and a judge over us. Who We never agreed to that part of it. And now you're killing people. That's just that's just unacceptable. We're not going along with this anymore. And and God responds, not with another well, he threatens it. <laughs> Let's get out of the way. I'm gonna kill them all. But in the end, his response is uh a parable of resurrection. Take this stick mm-hmm. that's dead. Now watch it come to life, watch it bear leaves and fruit in the hands of this man. That's the guy I want to represent me. And the people don't wholly embrace it, but it does shut them up for a while. But their final response is, we perish, we all perish. Whoever comes anywhere near this holy Lord God perishes. So we perish with perishing. Well, apparently, and that is kind of what you were told up front once you projected the promised land. But still, there's not the note of thankfulness. Oh, Lord, we could have been amongst those who the earth swallowed up. Thank you for not doing that. Thank you for bringing us here. Thank you for Moses. Thank you for the miracles you've done by it. No, that's not That's not what they respond. So to read through numbers is, is in some ways very discouraging. Because you keep thinking, look, if you, you, you've had the evidence as to who this God is and to how he behaves and to what he requires of you, You've seen his mercies. On the way to Sinai, you did a lot of stupid stuff. And you know what? God withheld his anger. He withheld his threats. He just got you to Sinai, gave you the priesthood, gave you the tabernacle, gave you the law. Then he started cracking down on things. And and he could have wiped you out so many times. And there's no thankfulness, no acknowledgement that, yeah, we're wretched sinners. and We really deserve that. Thank you, Lord, for saving us, for keeping us alive, sparing us bearing with us. There's, there's no... Numbers is the non-thankfulness book, mm. you know, which is why we're talking about it here. You said early on, God God puts us in the wilderness to prepare us for what comes after. And and the wilderness can have two effects on this. We, we, we've seen that in the younger generation, it served as a sort of boot camp and prepared them 
uh, for hard things. They learn to say of this hard thing, this is the hand of God, we will submit to it. The older generation did nothing but complain. The wilderness experience, the hard things, they they bring out what's in our hearts. They strip away mm -hmm. the thin veneer of civilization, of superficial virtue, the pretensions to godliness. And they leave us complaining and griping and complaining and whimpering and all of that. And as the catechism would say, that's not how you live the Christian life. Mm -hmm. The catechism focuses upon, first of all, the Ten Commandments, not as a way of salvation, but a way of saying thank you to God. Mm -hmm. And then secondly, on prayer, which it calls the chief part of thankfulness, which God requires. This is not enough simply to do the acts, but acts need to be interpreted. You can your... imagine just receiving an incredibly costly gift. Like, what's the first thing you should do? Saying thank you would be a start. <laughs> and yeah. then to put your life to poor use after receiving that gift, like somebody, I don't know, pays for med school for you or something to go and then use that med school education to, I don't know, do nothing, <laughs> not to use mm. that education. Or to kill lots education. of babies. Or to kill lots of babies. Yeah. Like you can imagine how the person who paid for med school would feel like this is the thanks I get. Mm. Yeah, exactly. Um, and the other part is you you, you take the, the wonderful gift. You look the person in the eye, say nothing, and walk off. And then you go off and you you build a wonderful career. That doesn't and, work either. <laughs> no, no. The, the giver is left thinking, but did you appreciate it? You understand? It? I'm right. the one who gave it to you. We want to hear thank you. Mm -hmm. And that, that desire to hear thank you is rooted in our relationship with God. God wants to hear thank you. He wants us to interpret our actions by the act of thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. So that on a weekly basis, at the very least, and preferably from day to day, we're constantly coming to God and saying, thank you. Thank you for the good things. Thank you for the trials. I thank God. What was it? I thank God for the mountains. I thank him for the valleys. I thank him for the storms he's brought me through. He came out of the 70s, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, the realization that there's all kinds of things that we should thank God for. And not all of them are pleasant. Not all of them feel good. I doubt that David, well, we can look at the Psalms. There, there's Thanksgiving in them. But when David was on the run, Thanksgiving was not always right at the tip of his tongue. He had to pray through that and sing through mm -hmm. that and get to the point where he could realize this, this is good. This is from the hand of my heavenly father. And uh, as Job says, I will come something like this. I will come out shining like gold. God uses all of these things in our lives, and he does it without asking our permission, and that's offensive mm -hmm. to us. And we need to humble ourselves and simply say, you're God, you know better. Another hymn from the from the 70s, let it rain, let it rain, let it pour, let trouble keep knocking at my door. Really? <laughs> I've prayed, I've sung that song a lot of times, and I, I stop and ask myself, do I really mean that? Do I really want trouble mm -hmm. knocking at my door? I find the answer certainly no. No, we don't. <laughs> and yet we know from Scripture that that's one of the ways that God sanctifies us. He puts us in hard places where there is no earthly comfort. And the only comfort can be from him, or he's the only source of provision. And then we need to be thankful. It's easy to be thankful when everything's going right, or at least to say the words of thankfulness. Uh, I, I suppose it's a real question. Is, is, is it easy to be thankful when everything's going great? Or do we assume my right hand and my arm have gotten me all this mm -hmm. stuff? And then throw God a thank you because that's what you do. But still not really being thankful, not having a heart of gratitude to who God, what God has done and who God is. And, and that's, I think, the thing we're spinning around right now. It, it's not that they simply didn't appreciate the specific acts that God had done for them. They didn't like God. Mm -hmm. They they just did were not thankful for God in His essence. They wanted a different God, the the God that their fathers had told them about. Crap, their style. He was offensive. There was not enough elbow room in the universe with this sort of God. This sort of God could not exist. He was logically incompatible with their way of life and their way of thinking. And and for this, Paul says, and so since they reinvented God. 
They, they looked at God and came up with a new God. Uh, you think about it epistemologically, that's huge. <laughs> I, can look at, I can look at a non-God and say, that's God. I can look at a dung beetle and say, God. I can look at a piece of wood and say, God. God says, fine, you want to be that stupid? Let's see what else you can do. <laughs> can you look at uh, someone of the opposite sex? Can you look at them? Can you, as a man, look at another man and say, woman, can you lose gender identity because you just don't know anymore? Can you make a difference between mercy and murder, between a piece of tissue and a human being? I mean, we look at our culture around us. How many things do we believe or, or take more and more take for granted that two generations ago, everyone would have laughed at? No, of course that you don't do that. That's stupid. And yet, step by step, we have lost our ability to distinguish one basic factor of reality from another. And you can think here of um, 1984, freedom is slavery, peace is war, war is peace. You know, the, hmm. the, the slogans under that regime where the attempt is to simply redefine everything in favor of the new order. And people buy into it because they've lost all reference points. They, having denied God, having rejected the God the Bible reveals, they're not. They're left with ashes. They're left with a handful of sand. And and God, as He works through Paul, as He works through the rest of the chapter, talks about some of these things. He talks about. Well, let me read a little. For this cause, God gave them up into vile affections, for even the women to change the nature or the natural use into that which is against nature. And I think that uh, refers to prostitution, but it could refer to, to lesbianism. Likewise, also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly. That's obviously sodomy, male homosexuality. And receiving in themselves that recompense of their error was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind, to those things which are not convenient, mild word, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Now, I, I doubt that anybody ever started out in their life as a small child saying, my goal is to be full of debate, deceit, and malignity. And his mom pats him on his head and says, great goals, Junior, go for it. I hope you succeed in all of them. These are not generally things we like. And yet Paul says that in once man rejects God, and starts pointing at cows and pigs and says, that's God. God says, fine, you're not being, you can't tell the difference between God and a creature. You're not going to be able to tell the difference between a man and a woman. Uh, the woman will not be able to tell the difference between the proper use of her sexuality and abusive situations, which she will accept for money and so on. And then this whole list of, and all of these other things follow. A broken epistemology leads to broken ethics. It leads to embracing all these things proudly, because it says that they, the one, though people realize these things are worthy of death, they not only do them, but they have pleasure in those that do them. We pay to see them on the movie screen. We we reject God, and then we receive all these things, and we applaud and clap and whistle. And yet, in most cases, if you stop people and said, why are you paying to see this? Why are you applying this? Why do you think these people are good? Get them away from their support group and from all their friends, and they probably won't have an answer. Mm -hmm. They'll probably say something, I didn't mean anything by it. Obviously, because you don't have intelligence <laughs> to mean anything. Your, your value system won't allow for it. There is no good or bad in your system. There is no meaning. So you can't mean anything. You just go along with the ethical herd and commit the same monstrosities, same atrocities that that everyone else does. Because it starts back with, you wouldn't say thank you to God. You wouldn't humble yourself before your creator, before his sovereign providence, 
and simply accept them and say, Lord, your will be done. I was listening to, I forget what I was listening to, but someone was talking about um, mental health over the past year and some of the the ways you can try to stay with it and stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things was writing down things that you're thankful for. And it wasn't like two or three, it was like 25 every day. Yeah. And like 12 of those should be about the things that you're mad about in your life. Ooh, ooh. <laughs> and uh, well, I think there's something to that. <laughs> you know, there's, there's that old song from White Christmas, Count Your Blessings. Mm -hmm. And there have been Christian imitations of it. But I think that puts some teeth into it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Give thanks for the things that make you mad. That stir you up, that get your your dander going. Because again, it's easy to be thankful for the things that are smooth and easy and pleasant. Hey, if God gave me two million dollars, I could thank. I could spend all afternoon <laughs> thanking God, no problem. God gives me cancer, that would be a little more difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, it's about priorities. Do we really trust God to know what's best for Him, the universe, and us? Uh, what happens when we don't think that God knows best? Mm -hmm. The ramifications are are extreme. Here, here's here's a side thing, and it is a side thing. I was talking to a young man the other day about the sovereignty of God. Very polite young man who I really appreciated. Um, but he was he he was following he he was doing the traditional struggle between freedom of man and and, and sovereignty of God. And so. He was walking down the traditional path, <laughs> clicking all the traditional buttons as he went. And he said, well, I know God can do all things. Does that mean that he does do all things? Does he really control all things? And he was very open to what to what the, what Scripture said. But, you know, it's one of those things you think through, as you call it. <laughs> and um, explain to him, well, look, what happens if there's something here that God doesn't control? Uh, how little is too little? At what point? Do you say, oh, that's that's insignificant. God doesn't need to control that. Really? <laughs> Cells in your body? Does that matter? The, the five minutes by which you miss your flight and end up not going where you could have gone and all the ramifications that come from that? You know, you, that, that person that you ran into who breathed in your face and you became very sick for the next... <laughs> do, where exactly... Do we have the omniscience and wisdom to say, this is so little a thing that it doesn't affect the future, it doesn't affect the universe? And if it does, then must we not accept with great gladness God's sovereignty over this? I'm glad that God controls all the asteroids and that he's not planning on sending smashing into the earth anytime soon. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad that God controls diseases and that not a single one is going to get to me that God hasn't ha hasn't planned to get to me. Well, that doesn't mean I have the freedom to be stupid about it. But having said that, it's not this big, huge monster that I need to, to cower over because God's got it. Whatever evil he sends upon us in this veil of tears, he's able to, sit, to turn to my good. And he's able being almighty God and willing also being a faithful father. And so, thank, thank you, Lord. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lord. We have to keep saying that. And, we, and, and as we do, it reframes, it refra re, what's the word? Re-something. <laughs> it alters our thinking mm -hmm. and, and our perceptions and our evaluations. And we, in consequence, become different people. We, we, have, we don't have the same immediate snap judgments about things because we know this is God. You know, sometimes you hear the phrase, well, that was a God thing. I got news for you. Everything's a God thing. All the things. <laughs> all the things are God things. All the things come from his fatherly hand. And for this, we need to be thankful. When we fail, we do, we do disservice to God. Mm -hmm. We also injure ourselves. We set ourselves up for a spiritual fall. Because over against uh, thankfulness is idolatry. Once you start not thanking God, you start rearranging in your mind who and what God is and can be. Well, my God would never do that. Yeah, well, since God just did, we have pressing questions now about who exactly your God might be. <laughs> uh, and so 
back again. Uh, our, our pilgrim fathers declared a day of thanksgiving when they came to these shores. And there have been uh, secularists who have attacked this and say, we know so little. All we know is that they... They, they said they set a day they set apart a day for Thanksgiving. How is that anything even remotely religious or worshipful or or anything? Well, they weren't <laughs> thanking the nameless, faceless universe. I can tell you that much. <laughs> Nor were they thanking the Native Americans for that matter. That's something that's actually showed up in children's books. It's mm -hmm. the opportunity for them to thank the Indians. I'm sure they were polite about it, mm -hmm. but that's not it. Thankfulness in the Calvinist tradition, and they were Calvinists, by the way, holds thankfulness very central to the faith. And to say that these, these men and women thanked God publicly means they, they exercised a religious function before the watching world and, didn't, and weren't embarrassed by it. And they thought that that was a priority, in fact, their chief priority, to say thank you to God. That is worship. Mm -hmm. Even if our secularist friends don't always understand what in the world we're doing. Yeah. Well, do you have any recommendations for us? Yeah, I have one. I don't think I've recommended it before. It's G.K. Chesterton's The Everlasting Man. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't recommend it without some severe qualifications. But it begins with looking at Cayman, and, and, and Ch Chesterton doesn't claim to be an anthropologist or archaeologist or anything of the same. He takes for granted, okay, this is what you say Cayman was like. All right, let's just assume you're right. Let's see what we know about Cayman. Let's go look at the caves. What do we find? We find incredible, beautiful artwork, and some of it religious in nature. So what do we know about Cayman? One, he was a man. <laughs> Two, <laughs> Two, he was religious. Three, he was an artist. There you go. That's kind of what humanity is. So we're not seeing any evolution here. And he, he goes on and talks in various directions about uh, these kind of themes, um, approaching evolution from a very different sort of direction, I think, and, and also talking uh, about um, the flow of history. My qualification, when he gets to Rome and Rome's war with Carthage, He's all in favor of Rome because although Rome had bad gods, Carthage worshipped demons that demanded the murder of their children. And that is so much worse than what Rome had that we should all stand back and applaud Rome. Well, G.K. <laughs> Chesterton is a Roman Catholic. And from at least from Dante on, if not earlier, there has been this, this idea of God prepared secular Rome so that he could turn it over to papal Rome so it could be the birthplace of, of the Church of Rome. Yada, yada, yada. And so Chesterton is affected by that. Like, yeah, guy, no. <laughs> Rome had its demons. You want to argue that the Carthage's demons were worse. You may be on to something, but that doesn't change the fact we're still dealing with demons here. Mm -hmm. And that's certainly how Paul looked at it. So, so there's that. But there's still Chesterton, of course, is always witty, uh, unafraid to maintain his Christianity before a hateful world and um, generally worth our time. So with some qualifications, cool. the everlasting man. Cool. What do you got? I have MacGyver. Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's been our, our TV show that we watch occasionally. And I, I've never seen it. I watched the pilot of the reboot oh. a couple of years ago just because I thought it was bizarre that there was a reboot. Yeah. Um, but Richard Dean Anderson is the main character and he's a special agent and just he's the he's the guy who can make a bomb out of a paper clip and uh, yeah. <laughs> it's it's cheesy in the best way. It's it's just by and large pretty wholesome and fun and cute. So, yeah, it's not as, you know, theological or <laughs> deep or interesting as The Everlasting Man by G.K. Chesterton, but you don't always want something theological. No, you don't. Sometimes you just want something to relax your mind. Yeah. And of course, he is the poster child for duct tape, so... Oh, yeah, that's true. I know. think I noticed he was using gaff tape in one episode, though, and I was Ooh. like, that looks like... Well, I mean, gaff tape is, in most use cases, superior to duct tape, in my opinion. <laughs> 
but that, yeah. That may be heresy up here. <laughs> Did I just lose my job on this podcast? <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. This has been a pleasure. Oh, we should tell people that Brian is on uh, vacation and he'll oh. be back, Lord willing, soon. Yes. He, yeah. I always hate it when people disappear from programs and you wonder. Hmm, oh, yeah. Brian did not get canceled. Him. He did not get <laughs> put on a bus and shipped out of town. Although he, he shipped himself out of town. <laughs> out of town. <laughs> Rather permanently, it seems. But he'll yeah. continue to show up here. Yeah. So thank you so much for listening. We appreciate you tuning in. Um, thanks also to David, our producer, and my lawfully wedded husband. Thanks to our financial supporters. We appreciate you keeping the show rolling. Um, if you'd like to join their number, by the way, you can visit our website, anchor.fm slash halting towards Zion, or you can send us an email at halting towards Zion at gmail.com. See you next week. <laughs>